Hey friends, welcome back to the Old Fashioned On Purpose podcast. So this season, I've been talking to some of my favorite authors and thinkers, and kind of accidentally, we've talked a lot about parenting and raising children. I didn't really intend for this season to be heavy on those topics, but it's turned out that it's been really fascinating. I've had some fantastic guests, and there's a lot of really cool research and data around those topics. So I'm excited to dive into uh, that realm again. And I really want to discuss this topic of tech and children today, because I know that's something that almost all modern parents are dealing with. Um, it feels like the world's spinning faster and faster. We're dealing with all these tech influences coming at us from every angle. And how do we combat that as old fashioned on purpose parents and kids? So I am so excited to have a guest back with me today. You heard her a few episodes ago, Dr. Susan Lin. We talked about the magic of play and why it's so important for our kids to have childhoods full of play. Um, but Dr. Lin has a brand new book that just came out called Who's Raising the Kids? And this one really focuses on the influence of tech and corporations that kind of weasel their way into our parenting. So she is the one to talk to on this topic, and I'm so thrilled to have you back. Thank you for coming on. I'm so happy to be here and to talk to you again. Yeah, it was such a great conversation. Um, okay, so just to kick it off, I'm going to ask the inevitable question. Uh, so according to your research as you, were, as you were writing the book, who is raising the children? That, that, what did you discover? I think um, basically, of course, parents raise children, communities raise children, but now children are spending an enormous time with technologies. And so corporations are also raising children. Um, we, the media and, um, and technology are hugely influential and powerful. They influence children's values, their relationships, their learning. And so um, I think we have to acknowledge that power and, and recognize that it's problematic. Absolutely. You know, I, I was listening back to our other interview together and just looking through your new book. And it really struck me, you know, I, I feel like a lot of times as parents, we're, we always feel like we're combating technology, technology, technology. But really, like you just said, it's it's really not technology. It's, it's the corporations that are fueling the technology. The technology, technology is just a tool they're using. And the power comes from them and the marketing efforts that are being put behind these devices. That's why they're so addictive. That's why we have the ads. That's why they're being pushed upon us. Is that driving force? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the technology, communication technologies are getting more and more and more, um, seductive and compelling but what's and and so that's that's true about you know smartphones and tablets and you know the coming metaverse it's going to be you know incredibly compelling but the real problem is the the business model for the companies that uh, that own the technologies that make the content and you know, basically they are in a war for our attention and will do, do, you know, just about anything they can to capture and hold our attention and the attention of our children. And, um, and they're good at it. And, and that's a problem for children and families. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the, the things I've been wondering about as I see, you know, just now childhoods are now defined by technology so much more so than they, they were when I was growing up or even after I grew up. Um, now every, every kid you see in a restaurant has an iPhone or a tablet and just become a normal part of childhood. But what are, what are those devices when we're parking them, parking our kids in front of them? And this is not an, it's spoken in a guilt filled way or, you know, meant to shame anyone at all because we all struggle with this what is that doing to our kids' brain, especially as those brains are developing? Like, is that going to cause potentially long-term effects? Do we have data on that? Or is it too new to really understand what's happening? So, um, 
when babies are born, you know, you, you know, they have, you know, millions of neurons that aren't, you know, necessarily connected and early childhood is, is, you know, they get increasingly connected, but our brains aren't fully mature until we're in our twenties. I mean, the frontal cortex, which is where judgment sits, doesn't mature until our twenties. And so what happens is that that what the brain does is strengthen connections that are used a lot and sort of slough off the ones that aren't used. So what children do and don't do in childhood really can influence the very architecture of their brain. And so if, you know, if children are going to be, you know, in front of screens, um, you know, several hours a day, you know, starting from infancy, then, you know, basically it's going to be harder and harder for them not to be in front of screens because they're, you know, their brains are being wired basically to, you know, to depend on screens for stimulation and for soothing. Yeah. So it's, it is creating those potential long-term effects and not just, is it, is it more, or maybe, I don't know, how, how do I phrase this? It's potentially I, wiring their brains then for how, you know, have, what they're, I'm, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, um, we, the, you know, the, um, the new technologies haven't been around long enough for us to have data on, on what, at least that I know of, that what adults are like, you know, who have spent a lot of time with screens. But, but there is evidence that the more that kids are involved with screens in um, early childhood, the harder it is for them to turn it off later. And the more t screen time, the more time they spend with screens, you know, when they get, get older. Um, and, and, you know, early screen time deprives um, babies and toddlers of what they do naturally to engage with the world and to learn about the world. Um, kids learn with all of their senses. Uh, and, and when they're involved, you know, with the screen, basically what they've got is sight, sight and sound. They don't even really have touch. I mean, because all they're doing is, you know, is swiping and tapping and, you know, maybe um, enlarging and making things smaller. But, but they need all of their senses in order to learn and to engage in the world. So that's a concern. And, and one of my concerns is things happen so easily on a screen that you don't have to put very much effort into it. And, and so um, that's concerning because what it can do is deprive kids of stamina and, and you know, the opportunity to try things out and experiment and, and to have the satisfaction of working hard at something and then having it come to fruition, especially, you know, what's offered to younger kids on screen. For older kids, you know, people could argue that, well, there are things to do that are, are more complicated, but for young children, there really aren't. So, you know, if you're building with digital blocks, you know, all you're doing is swiping and putting them on top of each other. You're really not learning about balance or gravity or, you know, whether you can put a big block on top of a, a small block. And, and those are, are such important lessons for young children. Yes. Um, a couple episodes ago, we it's, had... It's Dr. kind of funny. Go Sorry, ahead. I think, I think my internet's... I have a thunderstorm, so my internet's slow and we have a little bit of a lag, which is always frustrating. Um, oh, I just okay. was going to say, I hope, we, yeah. I had Dr. Kelly Lambert on a couple episodes ago, and she's a neuroscientist uh, and, and studies the effects of like when we use our hands for things, how it changes our brain and all the rewards that our brain gives us. And it makes me think of what you're just saying is our kids are missing out on that potentially because tapping doesn't trigger those, those systems in our brain to give us the happy feelings of 
building or creating or touching. Um, so yeah, I think we could be setting ourselves and our kids up to miss out on some of those, the very best pieces our brains are ready to reward us for. And, and the other, you know, problem is, so it's not just the act of what kids do with their bodies when they're, they're on screens. It's also the content. And, and, you know, when I, you know, look at the popular apps for young children, they're, they, they aren't creative. They don't promote creativity because most of the choices are pre-programmed. You know, so I remember um, when um, Play-Doh had an app um, uh, several years ago that was supposed to promote creativity. And Play-Doh, you know, especially before it started coming out in all these kits, but Play-Doh used to be incredibly creative. It was wonderful for kids, you know, to, to use and to explore and was sensuous and, you know, all that. That was so great. But on this Play-Doh app, it, it said it was to promote creativity, but there was only one way to do things. And there were only right choices. And, and if you only have one way to do things and there are only right choices, you begin to believe that there is a right way and a wrong way to do everything. And that, and, you know, that there's only one way. And that kind of, of of creativity and flexibility is just such an important life skill. So, um, so I, so that really concerns me. I mean, the, the loss of creativity and the other problem is that even with apps for young children, they're filled with advertising. And, and so, so kids are having fewer and fewer experiences that are unmediated by corporations. And, and, and one problem with that is that the message is basically, first of all, that everything's for sale. And, and, and second of all, that you need the things that corporations sell in order to be happy. And that's a big problem, first of all, because kids with less materialistic values are, you know, tend to be happier than kids with more materialistic values. Um, but also given where we are with, with, um, with global warming and the links between consumption and global warming, that's a terrible and destructive message that we're giving to our kids. In the book I talk about, um, I, I was, I was snuggling with a, a a five-year-old and he was very eager to play a Lego racing game with me online. And, and he had Legos, tons of Legos. He loved playing with Legos, but he only had this Lego racing game. And so, you know, we started to play and I wasn't surprised that you really didn't have choices for decorating your cars and, you know, none of that surprised me. But what shocked me is after we played for a little while, he said, now we can go shopping. And so oh. what, what Lego does is offer these digital things that you can buy with the points you accrue with, from the racing. Now, we weren't spending real money, and that can also happen online, you know, with kids being online. This was, you know, fake money. But it was still that the, that the purpose of the game, it wasn't to pre, be creative. It wasn't even to win or to beat your opponent, appoint, your opponent. The purpose of it was to accrue enough cash in order to buy something. Hmm. And that, you know, so that was incorporated into part, part of the game. And so the experience of the game the message is the experience of the game isn't as important as the reward that you get for playing it. And, wow. and that's another huge problem because one of the things that, that research is, is suggesting that when people receive rewards for doing something, once the rewards are taken away, 
they they um, they no longer particularly want to do the thing that they were doing, even if it was something that they liked doing. I love that part of your book, and I've been thinking about that so much. Um, just thinking about the intrinsic versus ex- extrinsic motivators, and just in my own kids, just like with you know, even chore charts, like we use chore charts sometimes, but like, how can I get them to feel like cleaning their room is their idea and it feels good on their own terms versus me giving them a sticker for cleaning their room. So do, do you feel like the apps and the reward systems that these games and these screens are providing us are kind of creating that false reward environment that we can get kind of hooked on and used to? Yes, and and that even, you know, continues with the ed tech industry in schools where um where kids are are playing games where, you know, they get points and they accrue points and so that can become more more important than the actual experience. And you know, the idea that kids are going to want to, to clean their rooms that may not be possible with a lot of kids, but but what is you know important for them to learn is they're doing it because they're part of the household, they're part of a family, and this is something that we do in our family. And and in this family, you know, we value having clean rooms if if that's a value of yours, and so that's the reason you know to do it. And, and, and one of the things that I, I think is kind of um, strange is that, that a big marketing um, technique for aimed at kids is to make everything fun. I mean, everything has to be fun, you know, like, like brushing your teeth. You know, I mean, Pokemon has a toothbrushing app where you get rewarded catching Pokemon by brushing your your teeth, or, um, you know, they sell musical toothbrushes or, you know, things like that. And, and I understand, you know, that, you know, it is helpful with very young children to make tasks fun, but first of all, you can do that without Pokemon, or you can do that without, you know, a, a, a Disney musical toothbrush or, you know, whatever brand, it happens to be. I mean, I used when you know when I was first brushing, teaching my daughter to brush her teeth. You know, we made silly sounds together, ooh, ah, ee, you, you know, that kind of thing. And so, I, I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't want her to think that she needed like to buy something in order to brush her teeth. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but. Um, I think that that the fact that we are training kids and ourselves to believe that we need these products in order to be happy or satisfied or, you know, whatever, I mean, that's a huge problem. It is. And I I feel like, yeah, it just dovetails so well with just the homesteading movement as a whole, because I feel like a lot of folks coming into the homesteading movement are doing so because they've kind of had that revelation. Um, I don't need as much as I've been told I need. I don't need to have the flashy things. I don't need to have a house full of stuff. We don't need to have what the Joneses have. You know, we can be happy with less. We can be happier with simplicity. Um, and I think that's, I think it's something that our culture is grasping for. I think there's that subconscious desire, even though it's really noisy and a lot of it's drowned out by all the marketing around us. But I think that's why some of these simple skills are coming back into popularity, especially with COVID when that happened, um, because people are like, they're feeling that need just to simplify and go, I don't, I don't have to buy all the things that I've been told I need to live. It's, it doesn't have to be that complicated. And, and um, I really admire, you know, I mean, I, I was, you know, a, a an adolescent and in my early twenties in the sixties. And so that was, you know, it was going back to the land and garden in gardening and, you know, the ecology movement, all of that came from there. And, and I really admired my friends who were good at all of those things. I'm not particularly good at all of those things. And, and, but even if, if you aren't, you can still be thoughtful about 
about what you're purchasing, about what you're buying, about, you know, to ask the questions, do, do I really need this? And then if you're buying, you know, things for your kids um, to, to, to provide them with toys and materials that can be used over and over and over again, that can be used in lots of different ways. Um, and we may have talked about this in our last conversation about, you know, a good toy is 90% child and only 10% toy. The best selling toys have, you know, all these things that they do. Um, but the best toys for kids don't do very much until a child makes them do something. Yes. I love that part of the, of the book. Um, and I know with my own kids, you know, most of the time we steer clear of the electronic toys, but every once in a while they sneak in and my kids don't play with them. Even if they want them initially, they just do not get as much traction in our house as the good old standbys, the Legos and the blocks and the, my, the little box of plastic farm animals we have have been one of our most used toys to date. No sounds, no electricity, nothing, no batteries. Um, but yeah, it, it's, because, it's yeah. better. Yeah. Because they don't, I mean, you know, ultimately they're boring because all kids are doing is pushing a button. Yeah. They're not doing anything. So, and, and the other, the other, um, the other issue that is um, troubling to me is that the toys that are, are, are marketed today, a lot of them are sets. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you have to get more than one, one isn't enough. You have to keep buying them and, and, and you keep, you know, even if you get a lot, there's always one more. And, and um, I, I know, you know, a lot of kids are, are most kids or more kids are online today than actually, you know, sitting in front of a television. Although basically a lot of them are watching television on these other devices. But I did sit down and watch um, Nickelodeon just to see what was being advertised. And what struck me is that the toys that were being advertised weren't even pretending to promote play. They were all about getting more of them, collect all of them, oh. you know, and, and that, you know, I mean, that's been around for a while with Pokemon and I don't know, maybe when you were a kid, uh, Beanie Babies, Yeah, but it's, it's, <laughs> Yeah, but it's so much more prevalent now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes. What is, is the influence of tech getting into schools? I know schools use more technology than they used to with curriculum and such, but is marketing able to get into those routes or is that pretty much, is there a barrier there? No, no, no. I mean, or yes, 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 I guess I should have said <laughs> Um, I'm not sure which is the right answer, but um, um, yes, there's a lot of marketing or there can be in the technology that kids are using in schools. Okay. Um, and, and the marketing, you know, first of all, you know, just like if you're using Google products in schools, you know, basically you're training your kids from a very early age to like Google or to love Google. Mm. And, and, and so we're, you know, so kids are, are kind of being, you know, branded, you know, by Google and they will use Google. That's Google's hope. It'll be like a lifetime brand loyalty. And, and, you know, there is, you know, research, you know, suggesting that what we use in childhood does affect what we're using in adults. We go back to childhood brands. Often we have warm feelings about them. But but the other um, thing that, that may not look like advertising or isn't actually advertising is, you know, we need to protect, protect children's um, data in schools. I mean, we, we need to make sure that it's not being, you know, captured and 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 used for other purposes or used for target marketing. And um, I spent a, a lot of time in, in the book, um, I spent a lot of time playing this math game called Prodigy. And, um, and there was a lot of marketing 
in Prodigy. It wasn't like for other products. It was to push kids to nag their parents to upgrade to a premium version. Mm -hmm. So one thing that, that a lot of apps do, they're called freemiums. They start out for free, but you can only do so much with them before you have, you have to start paying money. And it, you know, it's so much less fun not to be able to use everything on the app. And, it, and if kids are playing, you know, even, edu you know, supposedly um, games that are designed for education, like Prodigy, if they're playing with other kids, they can still see which kids have the paid version and which kids don't. And they can see that the kids with the paid version can do so much more than they can. So, um, you know, yeah, there's a lot of, of, of marketing that goes on in ed tech. And there's a lot of marketing that goes on in schools that isn't even linked to technology as well. Sure. I know a lot of the food, big food manufacturers are able to get in with different, you know, Coke and Pepsi and all those guys are in the schools. I've heard people talk about that before where that's, that was happening long before the, the technology yeah. came into play. Yeah. Um, right. You, you talked in the book about nagging and I don't, I had the statistic printed out, but I can't find it. Um, nagging is it, marketers are kind of banking on the kids uh, pestering the parents. Is that, it, yes. Didn't you have some data on that? That was pretty interesting. Cause I know we've all had our kids pester us for things. <laughs> We've all experienced it as parents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, nagging, nagging is in, extremely um, effective. And, um, and some colleagues of mine did a study a while ago that showed that there were like 10 or 11 year olds who were nagging up to 50 times for things. And nagging mm -hmm. can, can really wear parents down. I mean, first of all, it's exhausting. And second of all, you know, we want our kids to be happy. We want, we want to give our kids things. And so it's also hard to resist. But what, what um, in, in the late 90s, this company did a study on nagging, Western Media International. And, um, and the purpose of the study was not to help parents cope with nagging, the purpose of the study was to help corporations help children nag more effectively. Oh my God. Oh, they call it the nag factor. I know. <laughs> or pester power. And, and, you know, they found, you know, that it works like one out of three trips to a fast food restaurant comes about because of nagging. And mm -hmm. so, um, so nagging has also been around for a long time you know, and predates technology, but the, um, but the new technologies, because they're so compelling, make it, you know, an even more powerful. And the idea, it make, make the urge to nag even more powerful because, um, because of kids, you know, wanting the things, you know, that they see and they, that they see that other people have or other kids have. Yeah. And, and, it's, you know, one powerful. thing that I think yeah. um, we're, that one of the things that I think that, that what this reminds me of and that we're not, I think, as a society talking about enough is that, that the, the, the business model for the new technologies drives a wedge between parents and children. Um, and it does it in, in many, many different ways. I mean, one of the chapters in my book is called Divisive Devices, um, about, about how these devices come between, you know, parents and children. And, and it's as simple as most of them, the, the, the smaller devices are designed to be used by one person. And so, it, you know, it's, it, you, it's uncomfortable to have a lot of people around a phone. You know, you can't really see much. There's a lot of arguing, you know, we'll move it over here, move it over there. I can't see. I mean, it, they're, you know, they're really for, um, for individuals. And in fact, um, 
there, there's research su suggesting that if parents are reading from a book, they do a lot of cuddling with their children. You know, they basically hug them. And, you know, we've all done that, had, you know, child sitting on our lap or snuggling next to us, you know, and we're reading together, we can both see the book. But that kind of snuggling and cuddling doesn't happen so much with devices. Um, and even, and again, because they're, they're not designed for more than one person to look at, really. You know, they're small enough, you hold it in your hand. And, and so that's concerning. I mean, the other thing is, that's concerning is that parents, when, you know, I mean, people are saying, well, ebooks are better than regular books because things move and they talk and they chirp and they beep and, you know, all that. And isn't that wonderful? But, but what the research tells us is that the conversations that parents and children have when they're reading that kind of augmented um, ebook doesn't lend itself to, to literacy really, because it's not so much about the story or the plot or, you know, don't you wonder what this character is going to do? It's about do this. I wonder what happens if we push that. And so, um, so, so the whole, you know, move towards eBooks, you know, is problematic both on a cognitive le level for young children, but also on a social emotional level. So there's that. And then um, there's a research out of University of Michigan. Um, these researchers were observing parents in a playground, you know, where they were watching their kids. And, and, and what they found is that if parents were, if the parents were on their phones, they were a less likely to respond when kids called for them yeah. and B when they did respond, they responded with irritation. And so nobody likes being ignored and that does just, you know, escalate tension. And the same is true actually for kids. I mean, when young kids are on a device, it's harder to get them off of it. It's harder to get their attention. So, um, but at the same time, you know, we're all being sold this bill of goods about how wonderful these devices are for techno, you know, for um, learning and how these are going to help you with your parenting you know, and the devices, yes. you know, can read stories to kids and, you know, do all of these things that are really part of bonding. And, and, um, and, and that's very concerning if we're having kids bond, for instance, with Alexa more than, you know, with their parents. But I, I do, do I do want to say, I, I do, I just, I mean, one thing that always concerns me when we have these discussions, you know, about being a parent in the, you know, this technology age, I really feel, um, I really feel for parents today. I think that, that there are, are ways when it's much harder to raise children than it used to be. And that the idea that one family in isolation can successfully combat, you know, these gargantuan tech companies. I mean, you know, it's, that's not really possible. This is an issue for society and it needs to be dealt with on a societal level. There are things that parents can do. And I have a, a whole chapter in my book about suggestions of, of things that parents can do, but it's really important um, for me to know that parents know that I'm not here trying to make them feel guilty. I mean, raising, you know, raising children is wonderful and it's deeply satisfying and it's fun, but it can also be boring and tense and, and, you know, worrisome. That's another part about being a parent. And so, 
I, you know, when I, when my daughter was, was little, I didn't have to deal with smartphones or, um, or, or, you know, or tablets or, you know, the new technologies. So, um, when I went to the playground with her, and I also believe it's important for kids to be able to play by themselves and you don't have to play with them all the time. I mean, but I, I always yes. brought a book with me. And and there's uh, there's no research that I know of for adults showing that, you know, it's easier to get a parent's attention when they're reading a book. But there is research, first of all, that it's easier to get kids' attention when they're reading a book than it is when they're on a device, but also that parents, um, the parents who were engaged in analog activities like chatting with other parents were able to respond when, when their kids were calling them. I've noticed that with myself. Like I can, a child will ask me something when I'm on my phone. And I literally do not hear them. Like I do not hear them. But then when, if I'm reading a book or meeting bread dough or weeding the garden, I can hear them. It's, it's just, yeah. So even if there's not actual research yet, I, I feel like I could be a case study for that. It, there's something going on that there that's different. Yeah. Well, there is research suggesting that, you know, analog materials, like the things that you're describing, except for there is, there's not a study that specifically addresses reading books. That's all I'm saying. There, okay. there yeah. are studies yeah, that show other analog, you know, activities that you, when you're, you know, if you're chatting with other parents, you hear your child. Yes, absolutely. Um, but, you know, that was the one thing I loved about this book. It didn't have a, I didn't feel like it had a spirit of condemnation or judgment at all. It was very much, let's figure this out together. Here's what you need to know. And I think it's so important to have books like this as parents today, because like you said, um, we're, you know, we're the lone ship as parents in the sea of corporations and marketing, and they've spent millions, if not billions of dollars on psychology to, to make these irresistible to us and our children. So we need to have the data, we need to have the tools in order to, to put those boundaries up and be confident in our decisions. So I think it's, it's just such an important conversation to have. And I really appreciate you doing the work, putting all this together, because we need it as parents. We have to be more aware than like, you know, you, the parents, maybe my parents had to be, because there's, there's more that's fighting for our kids' attention. I, I think I think that's really true, and um, I, I I it you know it's the point is not to make parents feel guilty, but but I at this you know at the same time I think we need to you know take a long hard honest look at at what you know big business and big tech about what children's emergence in that immersion in that world is doing to them. And that's really, you know, why I wrote the book. I mean, basically, you know, there's this whole thing about strangers and don't talk to strangers. But, but you know, when we immerse, when we allow kids to become immersed with technology, they're spending a lot of time, not with the people, but with the values and, 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 and the, the beliefs of the people who make the content that the kids are immersed in, who are strangers and who most, you know, don't, they, they don't, your child's well-being is not their primary concern. It can't be. They're a corporation. Their primary concern is making money for their stockholders. Yep. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Big difference. Um, you mentioned this a minute ago, but I wanted to highlight it because I, I love this part. It was on page 223, um, and you said, I think it was a, a like a headline, it said, be skeptical of the prevailing myth that children's early device use will make parenting easier. Josh Golan puts it this way, far too often in discussions about young children, a false dichotomy is presented. Either you're on the floor playing with your child, or if you take a break, they're on a screen. So... In your opinion, what's that middle ground we can find as parents? Because I know I see a lot of parents struggling with this. And I'll be really honest. I love my children. 
I do not love playing on the floor with them 24 seven. You know, I'm a 37 year old woman and there are other things that I find interesting as well as playing Legos and Play-Doh. We do that sometimes, but how do you suggest parents find that balance and that middle ground? Wow. Well, um, and Taj Golan, by the way, is um, the executive direction, uh, the executive director of Fair Play, which um, is the new name for the organization that I started 20 years ago. I and some colleagues started 20 years ago called Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood. Um, so it's important for kids to be able to play alone. It's important for them, you know, to be able to play with other kids. We don't have to play with our kids 24 seven. And, you know, it's important to play with them sometimes, of course, but, um, but kids really do need time on their own and they need time in a safe space, you know, so, you know, there's, you know, with, with an adult presence for younger children, especially, but they need to learn how to generate their own amusements and to exercise their curiosity and their creativity. And so, and that's, you know, where, you know, the whole issue of boredom, you know, comes in because, you know, I'm bored is something, you know, that, you know, we can hear a lot from kids and that's, you know, annoying and it's annoying for a parent to hear that. And, you know, the temptation is to give them something to do. But boredom is actually useful because it, it, it's, it's a way of, of, of giving kids the space and the opportunity to find something to do, you know, to, to, to turn to their inner resources, to generate something to do or, or some game to play. And, and that's really important for kids that they're not, you know, dependent on outside stimulation all the time. So I never suggest um, that parents have to play with their kids, <clears throat> excuse me, all the time. I mean, I certainly did not. not and, and, and no parent does, or if you do, there's probably a problem. I mean, you just can't. It's, you know, especially part of being a parent is getting dinner and, you know, all, you know, keeping the house clean and a lot of parents work. So they don't really have the time to just, you know, play with kids all the time. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think that board, it does. No, I think that was, yeah, that's great. And I love, I love what you said. And I think boredom is such a powerful tool and just that open-ended boredom. Um, you know, I think about all the inventors, my kids and I have been doing a unit study on inventors and all the amazing ways they figured out their, their inventions that changed the world. And I'm like, they didn't have, you know, apps or technology or whatever, keeping them in boxes that, oh, you can only build your Play-Doh this way. You can only, you know, Thomas Edison, you can only build your light bulb within these parameters. They had, you know, it was just this wide open possibilities are endless and they had lots of free time to experiment and fail and try again. Um, and I think it's just so crucial. We, as modern people, we continue to keep that on the forefront. Yes, and, and, and failure is also important for kids to experience. I mean, because, you know, little failures are a way of coping with big failures, which are inevitable in life. And so you need to learn that you can fail at something and you can keep keep at it and keep trying. I think that's really, really important. Yes, um, I agree. I don't, I don't claim to have been a perfect parent or I don't claim to be a perfect parent, believe me. But, but one thing I did do with my daughter, um, and I, it's not like I, I taught her things, you know, taught her very many things. But the one thing I did do is, is I did actually teach her is that if a puzzle piece doesn't work one way, try it another way. And I think that's such an important co uh, concept to understand. If, you know, if you're, if you're having trouble doing something, try a different way of doing it, you know, but don't, you know, just, you know, give up or don't just keep 
trying the same thing over and over and over and over again. Yes. Yes. Good lessons for adults and kids. So resiliency and problem solving. Yeah. 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 It's a great metaphor. I think. I, 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 I like that one. Um, okay. So my, my final question for you is, do you have any tips for how we can have conversations probably with our older children, not with our toddlers, or maybe we could, I don't know on how they can become more savvy about the marketing that they're being fed. Like maybe how they can start to become aware of um, what marketers are doing or why if they get an urge to want or buy something, how they can understand the psychology behind that. Um, do you have any tips for those conversations as a parent? Um, yes, but, but my suggestions come with the caveat that, I mean, I think that media, media literacy and technology literacy is important, but, but I think that expecting kids to protect themselves um, is like blaming the victim in a way. I mean, I mm, really sure. think we need to keep our eyes on the fact you know, that this, as I said earlier, this is a societal problem. These are huge corporations spending billions of dollars manipulating us and our kids. So I think, you know, that, that any conversation that we have about media literacy needs to start there, I think. Um, and, but, but that said, I also think it's important to acknowledge children's feelings about the things they want, including the technology that, that, that they love. And it's important, you know, to, to validate those feelings. The feelings are real and, and children have as deep and passionate feelings as adults. They just don't have the cognitive wherewithal to manage them very well. So I think, you know, you, you need, we need to be able to say, you know, to kids, I know you love playing Fortnite. I understand. I know that you want to do this. I understand it's important to you, but I have problems with it. And here's why, or this is why I limit, you know, your time. It's, you know, I, I know you really love it and I understand that, but you're only going to have this amount of time, you know, to play it. And I think that you can start early on, you know, talking to kids about the fact that they're being manipulated by, by corporations. Um, and, and parents, I know, even start when kids are really little and they encounter a commercial on television or, you know, online, they'll say, that's a commercial. They're just trying to sell you things. And maybe the child won't understand cognitively but they might associate your distaste for the commercial um, or for the, the marketing that's going on. And, you know, at an early age, I think that that's helpful for kids. Um, and, you yeah. know, there are, as, as kids get older, um, you know, there are, you know, programs that, that help them not, not, I mean, like, curricula, you know, that can help them, you know, learn, you know, about how to identify misinformation or disinformation, which is increasingly important, or about how they're being manipulated. I think that that's very, very important, mostly because societal change, you know, takes a long time and they're growing up in the society where even though there are, you know, millions of people working to stop you know, the power that these corporations have, it takes time. And so it is important to give our kids tools. I agree. It's yeah, just I think we're not gonna... the be all and end all. No, for sure. I think it's a multi-prong solution to a very big problem. But I think the more, I, I love, I love yes. having those conversations on, on many different levels with the kids, just so they can have, like you said, the tools, um, even on little things like there's a magazine they get every month and on the back of the magazine there's these they give you stickers and like look there's free stickers and then they go look mom there's this free book or whatever you get it, and all you have to do is send in these stickers and i and so they're like why are they giving you a free book and i was like well i said let's look at all of the print and we you know we looked down and it was 
you get a free book with a $30 a month reoccurring subscription to this other program. And so we just talked through, not that that program was bad or, you know, it wouldn't be fun, but I'm like, well, why do you think they're giving you the free book? Oh, okay. I get it. Now they want me to pay $30 a month for, for 12 months. And I'm like, you know, I think, I think it's fun. I don't know. As a parent, I think it's fun to see those light bulbs come on sometimes. But like you said, it is a big, it's a big problem. We're not going to, the 12 year olds are not going to solve it. You know, we have to work on it from all the layers. Yeah. Uh, We do. Yeah. Well, this was fantastic yet again. Um, Can you remind our listeners and viewers where they can find you online if they want to follow along with your work? Oh, great. Yeah. Um, So my website is susanlin.net and um, you can find me there. Um, And, um, you know, I'd love to hear from you all. Awesome. And be sure to go check out Susan's new book. I think by the time this publishes and you guys are listening to this, it will have been on shelves for a week or two. It's called Who's Raising the Kids? Big Tech, Big Business and Mm -hmm. the Lives of Children. It's really good. Um, It's not scary. It's very reassuring as well. So check it out. It's going to be a good tool in your arsenal as an old fashioned on purpose parent. Um, Thank you again, Susan. I'm so thrilled that we got to have a second conversation. And I know this is going to be helpful for a lot of folks. So am I, Jill. It's always really great to talk to you.